Before the video starts, I'm going to leave a bit of a disclaimer right here. I know this video is going to be quite long, so what I'm going to do is leave some timestamps down in the description about certain topics I'm going to be talking about in the video. So if you don't want to watch the whole thing, you can go down and watch the ones that you want to watch and then leave the other ones alone. NBA Free Agency If you're like the average NBA fan, then there's a good chance you know what free agency is. You know that players are released from their teams in order to sign with other teams or their own team for a mutually agreed upon amount of money. That's pretty much common knowledge in the NBA world. But there's also a good chance that you don't know the finer details. You might not know what luxury tax is or what BRI stands for. If you don't, that's perfectly okay. In fact, I'm glad you clicked on this video. It's not a topic that's discussed that often, at least from what I've seen, so I'm sorta of here to make, you know, a comprehensive guide to free agency. So enjoy. Okay, before I start talking about free agency, there are a few things that I need to cover. The first of which is the Collective Bargaining Agreement, or CBA for short. Basically, the CBA is where the players and league executives decide on what to do with the money that the NBA makes. For those of you who are around in 2011, the season was shortened because the league and its players hadn't reached an agreement yet. The CBA they eventually agreed upon is the one that will stay into effect until July 1st, 2017, since there's going to be a new CBA that the league agreed upon this last December. The new CBA will fix some things to help make use of the inflated BRI that the NBA is now getting thanks to the new $24 billion television deal that they signed. BRI stands for Basketball Related Income, which is basically the amount of money that the NBA makes in a year. Of course, since this is the NBA, we're talking about regular season tickets, league passes, parking tickets, a lot of things. It's just basically the NBA's salary, and then since it's so big, they have to split it with 30 teams. And so, since this is mainly a players league, about 49-51% to 51 of that amount of the basketball related income, or BRI, goes to the players' salaries. It's divvied out throughout the 30 teams, and teams are able to use that allocated amount in order to sign players, but they can only go so high. This is called the salary cap. The NBA has a soft salary cap compared to the NFL or NHL who both have hard salary caps. Meaning they have a certain amount, say 90 million, to spend on their roster and that's it. There are a few tiny exceptions there but those rarely get used. Now the MLB has a soft cap as well. Which by the way means that there is a hard cap but you can bypass that with little to no effort. But it's way more lenient than the NBA. The MLB soft cap is like a speeding ticket. If you go past it then you get a fine. But that's about it. That sort of makes it unfair since the big cities like LA or New York can pay more than say you know Baltimore that's the main reason why none of the other sports leagues do that but anyways the NBA is unique in their salary cap situation Alright, now that we know what exactly a salary cap is, how much is it actually? For the 2016-2017 season, the salary cap, thanks to the $24 billion television deal they signed, jumped from $70 million all the way to $94 million, meaning that teams had opportunities to sign ludicrous contracts like, like Al Jefferson for $10 million, Kent Bazemore to some crazy contract, and most notorious of all, Tim F.M. Osgoff for $16 million a year. Oh, and Joe Kim Noah, I forgot about that one, also $17 million a year. But like I said before, the NBA has a soft cap, meaning that teams can spend more than $94 million. This year it's going to be about $99 million, but you can spend more than the salary cap as long as you don't go above a predetermined tax level. If you bypass that predetermined tax level, which for this offseason will be roughly $119 million, then you have to go through something called the luxury tax. The luxury tax system is just a way for the NBA to keep teams in check and also make a little bit more money in the process. So I'm not going to go through everything here, you can read it and pause it if you really really want to, but I'm going to go through the basics, which is basically this, if you spend too much money over the tax level you're going to get fined. For example, since next season the tax level is approximated to be $119 million, if a team spends $124 on their roster, then they have to pay $13.7 million in taxes. The more you spend, the more money you're going to have to pay, like the rate of where it goes goes up. For example, if a team spends $139 on their roster, then they have to pay an extra $95 million. That's basically the cap itself. So yeah, the NBA doesn't want for people to be spending so much money over the cap, but that really didn't stop the Cavaliers. Since LeBron was the GM, they had to spend as much money as possible, leading for them spending the most money on a roster in NBA history. The Trailblazers are about to overtake that, but still it's a pretty crazy record right now. But in 2015, when LeBron came back and they went to the finals, the Cavaliers had to spend $54 million in luxury tax. 
Bucks. So yeah, that took a pretty penny out of the owner's pocket. But they were able to win a championship next year. But yeah, for teams like that, that really don't care about spending over the tax level too much, there's also little extra punishment for teams who decide to do that. The apron. Now, the tax apron is for only the teams that spend a lot of money. In 2016, the only team that was above the tax apron was the Cavs, and we know they had the highest payroll in history. Two years before that, it was only the teams like the Cavs, like I said, the Warriors, the Bulls, and the Thunder, teams that spend a lot of money. But what exactly is the tax apron? Well, for its specific definition, it's an amount that's $4 million above the tax level. But under the new CBA, it's going to be above $6 million. Now, if you're above the tax apron, you have a lot of restrictions on you. When you're above the apron, you don't get access to the biannual exception. Also, if you're above the apron, you get a smaller mid-level exception. And also, you can't sign and trade players. If the Houston Rockets had spent, let's say, $120 million, they wouldn't be able to sign and trade Chris Paul right now. They would have had to wait for free agency, and the Clippers wouldn't have gotten anything. But if you try and use any of these, like say that the Houston Rockets were above the tax apron, and then they tried the sign and trade thing, then they wouldn't be able to go above the apron for the rest of the season. They would be hard capped at a specific amount. So then they would have to try and move all sorts of contracts in order to get a better team trying to get Paul George and all that. It would just be a hassle. So yeah, it's not good to be above the tax apron. No one wants to be above it, which is why rarely any teams are. All right, before we can talk about free agents, we have to talk about contract extensions. And before we can talk about contract extensions, we have to talk about rookie contracts. When an NBA player is drafted in the first round, they are given a guaranteed contract that can vary anywhere from about six million all the way down to just one million, or a little bit below one million dollars. For the first two years, they play under the team they are drafted under, unless they are traded. And then for the third year, before they're signed, the team can decide whether or not to decline or accept the team option. If they decline, the player becomes an unrestricted free agent, if they accept, they continue playing on. The same thing happens for the fourth year, where the team can either decline or accept the team option that the player has on his contract. And then for the fifth year, the player becomes a restricted free agent, whereas the team can sign them back with a qualifying offer or an extension of the contract. Now, normally teams are able to sign their player for up to four years and four years only, but there's one player on their team that they can sign for a five-year extension. This is called the designated player, and that designated player can only be chosen if they're coming off their rookie contract and if they've met at least one of these goals. So instead of getting the maximum of 25% of the cap, which is around 22 to 24 million in 2016, to be able to sign a five-year extension that's worth 30% of the cap, which is a lot higher at 28 million. This is called fifth year 30% max, or the Derrick Rose rule, since it came about in 2011 when Derrick Rose was the MVP, and they gave him this extension. Here are a list of players that were on it, but some of them aren't now. But in this new CBA, the 2017 CBA, they decided to give teams another ability, the designated veteran player extension, or the Kevin Durant rule. Now, the reason that the designated veteran player extension is called the Kevin Durant rule is, well, because of his move to the Warriors last season. Even though the Thunder kept him since 2007, the Thunder were only able to offer the same amount of money that every other team in the league could. Since he was in his ninth season, every team could offer him the same amount of money. 26.5 million dollars or 30 percent of the cap well now the nba not wanting for something like that to happen again decided to add in this rule it's pretty simple if you played with a team for eight or nine years then instead of being able to sign a contract extension that's the same as everyone else you can sign a five-year deal worth anywhere between 30 to 35 percent of the cap for example curry's been playing since 2009 now that he's coming off his four-year deal that he signed with the warriors he is now eligible for the designated veteran player extension which gives him up to 209 million dollars over five years but of course since this is such a massive amount of money there's some pretty elite requirements in order to get into this designated play extension club in order to be even considered you would have to make the all nba team last season or two out of the three seasons before that defensive player of the year last season or two out of the three seasons before that or the mvp in the last three seasons so yeah that's some pretty elite company Okay, we've all heard about maximum contracts, how this dude signed to a max deal, how that dude didn't sign the max deal with this one team, and went ahead and signed the max with another team. We've heard all of that, but what exactly does the maximum deal mean? It's a little more complicated than you may think. Not that complicated, but still enough to be like, huh, wow, I didn't know that. So, for your first six years in the NBA, you're only allowed to get 25% of the cap. 
just this last season, that means that your maximum was $22.1 million. Then for your 7th to 9th years in the NBA, you were able to get 30% of the cap space, which would be $26.5 million, which is how much Kevin Durant got when he signed with the Warriors. And then if you played over 10 years in the league, you get to have 35% of the cap, just like LeBron James where you earn $30.9 million a year. If I'm not mistaken, LeBron James is the only person to have a max contract like that. Which Steph Curry might succeed in the coming weeks? Like I said before, the NBA has a soft salary cap, meaning that there are multiple ways to bypass that cap. These are called exceptions. The first of which I'm going to be talking about is the biannual exception. Now this is one that isn't used that often because even though it says it's biannual, which means twice a year, you can only use it once every two years. It's sort of weird how they named that, but whatever. It's not that much money. For this offseason, it's only going to be $3.3 .3 million. That's barely anything. And if you do use the biannual exception, then you are hard capped at the apron, which remember is $6 million above the tax level. You can use this exception to sign more than one player, but you have the limited amount of money that you have, $3.3 .3 million. In all honesty, it might just be easier to use the minimum player salary exception. This is an exception that says that you can sign any player to a minimum contract, no matter how much you're above the cap. It doesn't matter if you're above the apron, it doesn't matter if you're paying $200 million, you're still able to sign players to the minimum contract. And you can sign them up for two seasons, just like the biannual contract the disabled player exception. Now this exception is for the teams that have an injured player that can't play for the remainder of the season. It could be a multitude of things, torn ACL, meniscus, and even death. If something happens to the player that renders them helpless to the team for the rest of the season, then at least from July 1st to January 15th, teams are able to sign a player that's worth half the player's salary or for this amount of money. And it's only a one year deal. The rookie exception. Now, if the Portland Trailblazers were able to get the first pick in the 2018 NBA draft, even though they'll likely be above the apron, they'll still be able to sign the rookie, say, I don't know, LiAngelo Ball. They sign LiAngelo Ball to about $6 million contract, even though they are above the apron. The reinstatement exception. This one's a little out there, but it's basically this. If a player was banned for doing drugs or something like that, and then they're able to come back into the league, the team that had him can re-sign him for his prior salary. So let's take OJ Mayo. Right now he was suspended for drug use. He can come back after his suspension is done and go ahead and play for the Milwaukee Bucks again for his original salary, no matter how much above the tax level that the Bucks may be. The mid-level exception. Now, out of all of the exceptions I've talked about, this is probably the one that you know about the most. I mean, it's the one that teams use the most. It's the one that's talked about the most. I mean, what do you hear more, mid-level exception or biannual exception? But even if you haven't heard about it at all, it's all good, I got you. So first things first, there are three different types of mid-level exceptions. There's the non-taxpayer mid-level exception, there's the taxpayer mid-level exception, and there's also the room mid-level exception. All three of these are basically the same thing, but there's one little difference it just matters where you are in the chain but here let me explain in order to qualify for the non-taxpayer mid-level exception you have to be over the cap but you have to be under the apron which is six million dollars above the tax level so take the golden state warriors last year they were over the cap of 94 million dollars but they were under the tax level of 113 million so that means they're able to get access to the non-taxpayer mid-level exception which in 2016 was 5.6 million dollars but now this offseason if you're under the apron but over over the cap, like the Houston Rockets, you have a mid-level exception that's worth $8.4 million. And you can sign any amount of players with that $8.4 million, and you can sign them for up to four years. Now, the taxpayer mid-level exception. These are for teams that are above the apron, $6 million above the tax level. So take the Cleveland Cavaliers, they're above the tax level, they can only use this one. It's basically the same as the non-taxpayer mid-level exception, except they get less money to use. And the maximum amount of years they can sign a player goes down by one. Like for this offseason, the Cavaliers can use their mid-level exception, but they can only use $5.1 million, compared to the $8.4 million that the Rockets get to use. Now for the room mid-level exception. These are for teams that are under the cap. They're not over it, they're not over the apron or anything like that. They're under the cap that's set by the NBA. For example, you could take the Brooklyn Nets. They'll be able to use the room mid-level exception, but if they do end up using it, then they won't be able to use the biannual or the two other mid-level exceptions I talked about. And they're only able to sign a contract for two years. And the money's even less than the taxpayer mid-level exception. This offseason is predicted to be about $4.3 million. Now, if you've ever played 2K and played my GM or my league, 
then you most likely know what this is, but you don't know all about it because 2K doesn't go into detail. Or maybe it does, but you never read the, like the tutorial thing because no one ever reads that. I mean, it's too complicated, but whatever. The Larry Bird exception is where the team has bird rights on a player. They can exceed the cap in order to re-sign that player. The way you attain bird rights is by staying on the same team three years in a row. It doesn't matter if it's three one-year contracts or three-year deal. If that player stays on the team for three consecutive seasons, they can sign a contract extension without having to worry about the cap for up to five years. However, in the actual CBA and like the, you know, document that talks about everything in the legalese language, this is called qualifying veteran free agent, not bird rights. The reason it's called bird rights is because the Larry Bird exception first appeared in 1983 and, and people believe that it was the Boston Celtics that first went over the cap to sign Larry Bird for seven years. Even though it's not true, but still, that's why it's called bird rights. Now, what you might not know about the bird rights is that there's another form called the early bird exception. This is basically the same thing as the Larry Bird exception, except for instead of staying on the team for three consecutive seasons, you can sign it after staying on the team for two consecutive seasons. Now this one, you can only sign up to four years instead of five. And you can only sign up to a certain amount above the previous contracts. If that doesn't make sense here, let me break it down for you. Say a player signed a two year $20 million contract or $10 million a year. If the team wants to re-sign them, the max that they could sign him up for is $17.5 million. Compared to the max of, say he's been in the league 8 years, $26.5 million. Now there's one last exception that's not really a Larry Bird exception, but it sort of is. You know, let me explain. The non-Bird exception. In the CBA, the legalese language, it's called the non-qualifying veteran free agent. But we call it non-Bird exception because it's simpler. This is basically for players that have only been with the team one season instead of two or three. So let's take Dwayne Wade. Since he just played one season for the Chicago Bulls, if he hadn't picked up his player option and he declined it, then instead of getting the max that like would be like $30 million, he would only be able to get $29.5 million, which is still a lot, but remember that Dwayne Wade was ridiculously overpaid last season. Now these bird rights are able to be traded along with a player like Chris Paul, Next season, he'll still be able to sign a great contract because his bird rights were traded with him. So even though he's on a completely new team, he hasn't even played for them yet, the Houston Rockets can still sign him to the same deal that the Clippers could, even if they are above the cap. Now, options are something that LeBron James is notorious for. He signs for one year, then his next year will be a player option. And since he's LeBron James, it gives him all the control that he needs to, you know, stay in the Cavs, go to the Heat, go back to the Cavs, and maybe even go to the Lakers. But... What exactly are options? Options are things that a team and a player both agree upon in the player's contract. It's basically, it's a gateway to free agency. So let me explain, there are three different types. There's the player option, there's the team option, and the early termination option. The player option is where the player decides to opt out of their contract. And this can only happen once per contract. So say a player signs a four year deal with the team, then like say the second year, they can exercise their player option and either decide to stay with the team for the next two years or go into free agency and become an unrestricted free agent. Now a team option is where the team gets to decide whether or not they wanna keep the player. So let's take Kevin Durant. When he left for Golden State, he had a player option on his contract as opposed to a team option. And he used his player option in order to opt out and become an unrestricted free agent. If he would have had a team option, then the Thunder could easily just decide to keep Kevin Durant for that next year. And then if they win the championship, then they would sign a new deal that'd be worth the max since he would have played 10 plus years in the league. But unfortunately that didn't happen. But anyway, then there's the early termination option. This is only allowed when you have a five year contract. Basically, it's a player option for longer contracts. After you've played four years with the same team, then you have the early termination option, whereas you can either opt out of the contract and go into free agency, or you can stay with the team for the full five years, which is something that Dwayne Wade opted out of when he was in Miami. Now, for the rookie contracts, is a little bit weird. For the first two years, the player is guaranteed to play on that team that they were drafted by, unless they're traded, and then there are two years in a row where they have two team options in a row. So for the third year of the contract, the team can either put the player to free agency or keep them, and then for the fourth year, they're able to keep the player or put them into free agency, making them an unrestricted free agent. Now, if you are an unrestricted free agent, but if the team that you want to go to doesn't have enough cap space to sign you, there's something that you can do. You sign with your original team, and then the team adds a clause that says that the contract is invalid after 48 hours. Then your team can trade for the team that you want to go to. For example, the Chris Paul trade. Chris Paul wanted to go to the Rockets, but the Rockets didn't have enough cap space to sign him. So instead, Chris Paul opted into his final year of his contract, and then was traded from the Clippers to the Rockets. This phenomenon is known as sign and trade. For all obvious reasons, the player signs and then they're traded. 
Now, before free agency actually starts, there's a thing that's called the moratorium period, which is basically a waiting time. Any deals that are made in this period are not actually official until the moratorium period is over. It lasts from July 1st to July 6th. In the past, it was from July 1st to July 11th, but they took that out in the new CBA. So not much is done here. People say that free agency starts on July 1st, but in actuality, it starts at the end of the moratorium period. After like the attorneys and the lawyers and the money guys, after they set everything up for their teams. During this time, the only thing that teams can really do is sign qualifying offers. Well, what exactly is a qualifying offer? Well, a qualifying offer is basically just a one-year deal that the team that they're already on gets to offer them. This is only applicable after a team has a player that played for four years under their rookie contract, and they can offer them 30% more than the money they made last year, at the very most. So say next year, LiAngelo Ball gets drafted number one. After four years, his team will offer him a qualifying offer. Since the year before, he would have made about $10 million since he was the first pick in the 2018 NBA draft draft, the max they could offer him is $13 million. But of course, not many people are going to accept that, especially if he's actually an all-star by that time. So that's when they can sign him to a maximum qualifying offer, which can either be a long-term contract that gives him 25% of the max, or if he does very, very good and meets the criteria of the fifth year 30% max, then he can play for five years and get more money in the process. Now, of course, if the player doesn't agree with a qualifying offer, they can still go into free agency, but for any team that tries to sign him, the original team has the opportunity to match the contract. So for example, let's take Nerlens Noel. This year, he's going to be a restricted free agent, so teams can throw any amount of money they want at him, like say four years for $21 million a year. Since the Mavericks are gonna sign him to a qualifying offer, that means that he's a restricted free agent under the Mavericks, and the Mavericks can match that contract, and then the Mavericks can take him back. But of course, you have to have enough cap room in order to do this or the other team gets the player. Another option is just to sign a one-year qualifying offer. Then the next year they can become an unrestricted free agent. Now when you're an unrestricted free agent, you can go wherever you want. It doesn't matter if you want to go to the Nets or to the Warriors, as long as the team has enough cap room for you. Even if they don't, you can take a pay cut if you really, really want to. It's unrestricted free agency, with emphasis on unrestricted and free. While sure there may be some backlash for what you do, in the end, it's your decision. You can go wherever you want. But until you decide which team you want to go to, the team still suffers a little bit. You see, when someone's an unrestricted free agent, you would think that the team wouldn't have to deal with their monetary situation. But there's a thing there that makes it a little bit more fair, called the cap hold. With the cap hold, until the free agent signs a contract, then there's some money in the cap that a team can't use until the player signs a new contract. If you want to see how much it is, I'll put a chart right here, you can pause the video if you like. But yeah, notable unrestricted free agents this season. Kevin Durant, Steph Curry, Blake Griffin, Paul Millsap, Gordon Hayward, Kyle Lowry, Drew Holiday, Danilo Garnari, Sergi Baca, just to name a few. Yeah, with those free agents I just named, this offseason is going to be very interesting, this free agency will. In fact, the reason I made this video so that I could know exactly what's happening in free agency, because we know about, like, you know, the basic signings and all of that stuff, but we really don't know the inner workings about that, and so that's why I made this video for myself and for all of you guys, if you're still here, even for the guys who already left a long time ago. But anyways, shout out to Larry Coon, CBA FAQ. That thing is a cheeser. Without that thing, I couldn't have made this video. They have an agreement thing. Like I said, it was in legalese, the CBA agreement with the NBA and the NBA Players Association. That thing's a bunch of legalese, like over 500 pages. No way I could have read that all. But the Larry Coon, CBA FAQ, that just condenses like everything down. Now though, it's a little bit outdated since the 2017 CBA is already here, but it's still very, very useful. I'd advise you to go check it out. The link's down in the description. And there are some things that I didn't mention and you'll probably find them over at that CBA FAQ. And I'll also leave down the link to the official agreement of the CBA in 2017, just so you can see how crazy it is. And if you wanna read it, you can go ahead and do that. But anyways, with all of that out of the way, see you next video.